before we get to the uh, seven. Um, so as I recall, the checkpoint to question eight, but don't take my word for it. Look at wherever it says to stop. Um, all right, one of the things I wanted to comment on, um, so in the labs and the homeworks, et cetera, who here has found kind of the backstory of those interesting? Try hand raising. Thanks. Anyone? Interesting? All right. So one of the things that is important here. So first of all, I find them really interesting. Um, but one of the things that's important here is what I wanted to point out is that if you're doing like data science as like for a living, um, you know, or even if you're doing uh, you know, some, actually somebody talked to me the other day, they want to do neuroscience and use data science with it. Um, so whenever you're doing something like that, there's a domain specific knowledge it's often referred to as or jargon or, um, you know, kind of the language of that environment. So one of the things as uh, somebody who's going through this kind of uh, progress through the university, you have to learn is how to kind of immerse yourself into what in a lot of the industry is referred to as a vertical. Okay, so the project is largely about global poverty, right? So global poverty would be considered a vert, like a vertical. Okay, uh, the ones I primarily worked in were financial services and pharmaceuticals. Um, so those are other verticals. So one of the hard things to do, right, is okay. I've got all this knowledge, which we usually call horizontal knowledge, about you know how to prepare data or how to uh, analyze it or how to uh, you know get results out of it. That's the horizontal thing but I need to know enough about the vertical to apply the horizontal to it. So part of the reason for the backstory on a lot of these is to also teach you how to do that. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's important that you try to, you know, kind of understand the story that's going on um, as well as, you know, there's like cross reference links sometimes and stuff like that, because it kind of teaches you how to quickly learn uh, that vertical because it's no fun at all when you walk into your first meeting with um, you know, a client say or whatever, and you don't know anything about what they're talking about, right? Half, half the conversation is just going over your head. So it helps a lot to be able to quickly pick that stuff up um, and know how to find it quickly so that you can get an idea. So when you're in that meeting, right? That you just don't stare blankly half the time trying to figure out what they're talking about because it's all acronyms and jargon, right? So. Uh, that's, I just want to point that out. It's not kind of a waste of time to really understand those backstories. That's something else to learn, in a sense. It's not something you really get tested on very much, but it is kind of important to your kind of long-term use of any of these tech, uh, like kind of techniques or methods. All right, so today, I'm oh, sorry, do we have any questions about the project? I don't know if anyone's looked at it yet. Um, all right, cool. So if you do have questions, put them on Piazza. It's beneficial for everyone uh, because it, you know, it's one of those classic things. You know, if you have a question, somebody else probably has, has the same question. It's nicer to answer it once. All right. So today we're going to talk a little bit about um, a person named Sir Francis Galton, um, who had some later in his life had some very questionable uh, beliefs, um, but did some really interesting data science around, uh, basically around prediction, okay? Uh, and the reason we're kind of using his stuff is because he's one of the earliest ones. Um, you know, so prediction is, you know, something that had to be kind of discovered, like this is something you can do based on data. So he uh, did some stuff and that's what we're gonna talk through. Um, and he was also, interestingly, uh, Charles Darwin's half cousin. Um, so, you know, kind of a little random backstory. If you want to know more about him um, and why I say some of his beliefs are questionable, uh, he, you know, go read his Wikipedia page um, and, uh, you know, kind of just take that in context or a grain of salt, whichever way you want to put it. Um, so that's him. And so we're going to talk about prediction. And we'll go through the usual dance of does the computer work and all that jazz. Um, all right, so it's a little bit bigger. I can almost read it. Um, let me do the needful. All right, and then we're going to load um, the Galton CSV, which basically has the data that we want to start with. 
Um, and, oh, it did finish cooking. Okay, so I kind of want to point out what's here, right? Um, so this family, okay, is really an ID, okay? So, um, or what we refer to as an ID, which is like an identifier, a short for identifier. Uh, so one means they're all the same family, not named, named one. Um, and then two, all the same family, name two, you get it. Uh, father, this is their height in inches. Uh, this is the mother's height in inches. This is the um, average, except um, going through this data, the, uh, we, it, it's like, it's actually a weighted average, but I'm not sure how it's weighted exactly. But, you know, for the sake of this argument, call it the average or think about it as a weighted average. Um, then there's the number of children they had. Uh, and then, you know, and then the number in order that they were born, um, and then the gender, and then the height of the child when they were an adult, okay? Because if this was their height at, you know, four, that would be really weird. Um, but yeah, them as an adult, okay? And so you might be able to guess where we're going with this. Um, but let's take a look at trying to understand that data a little bit better. And so we're gonna use a histogram to try to get a sense of kind of the, the skew of that data. And as we talked about last time, we talked about bell curves. Um, because this is a much bigger data set, right? It's like a, nearly a thousand rows. Um, you can see that bell curve, right? It's really kind of showing up. Um, basically, you know, if your data set is too small, uh, you, you get a, a lot or anomalies are a lot more visible, right? As you raise the data set, um, they, you know, it starts to spread out the way it should. All right, so there's the histogram of the, that kind of average height of the parents, okay? Um, so it looks like, you know, at the time of this data, which was obviously quite a while ago, you know, maybe 69 inches or so, uh, you know, something, something in there is like um, where most people fell. Um, and in the U.S., let's see, uh, five, it's actually about the same height for the average male uh, today in the U.S. The U.S. last I knew was about 5'10", which is, uh, you know, 70 inches, if I did my math right. Um, all right, so then, but if we take a look at the children's height, and I use the right window, what do you think? Is this going to be skewed higher, lower, the same? Any theories? Come on, anybody's got a theory? All right. Um, I flipped it, so I looked, but before <laughs> I looked, I thought it was kind of mirror. Mirror? Um, I actually expected it to be skewed taller. Um, and the reason is, is because over time, people have been getting taller. Uh, the thing is, is that when I say over time, that's like 5,000 years. Uh, this is like 100 years. so you know, maybe the effect is so negligible that you can't really see it. Um, but you can see, it, you know, it's roughly comparable. It might be skewing a little bit taller. Um, you know, it's a little hard to tell if we don't compare them directly. Uh, but, you know, maybe we'll do that in a second. Um, so, can anybody tell me how we could compare the two, like, together? Like, give me the syntax of the command I would run. So I will start it at least. All right, so uh, what graph would I use? Do I have to start calling on people? You could use a scatter plot that would do that would show you something slightly different though. What I want to do is more directly compare the two prior graphs. Right. So I'll give you a big hint, right? Which is, we'll start with a histogram because what I want is that those two kind of layered on top of each other, right? So what do you think I pass as the two things to this histogram? Right, so I add the two columns 
that I'm interested in. And rather than mistype that like crazy, which I likely would, um, now I can actually see the one overlaid on the other. Um, and it's kind of interesting, right? See, the mid parakite seems to actually have a lot more in this area, right? And it's kind of more spread out for the child height with the yellow. Uh, hopefully, you all can see the two colors. If you can't, there's like bars here. Um, and it's a little different shade here just because it's actually overlaid. Um, but my theory about it being the children being taller is like completely off, right? They're, they definitely look like they're kind of skewed lower. Um, does anybody have any theories about why that might be? Even though, like I told you, right? I mean, it is a fact that humans have been getting taller. So why do you think it might be skewed lower? Any theories? What else do we know about humans and heights? Environmental, but there's one really big environmental factor. No, well, yes, but um, all of the children heights here are like, let's just say 20 years old. They're all at, at their full adult height. It's inherited, yeah, so that would, Give us some information about mid parent height to child height, but not necessarily this skew, right? You're all reaching way too far. There's one really obvious thing. It could be nutrition, like environmental facts. You said nutrition, right? Yeah. Um, nope, still going too far. Very, very simple. There's about, I don't know, let's say, uh, about 50% difference in this room. Gender. So women tend to be shorter than men, right? So if the children have more women, right, than they do men, then that would potentially explain the skew, right? So we're talk about that more later. Um, but uh, I, I really thought it would be a much, I thought it would be a much easier question. Um, okay, so somebody over here uh, suggested another graph we could use to take a look at these two relationships. Um, and let's just see what I got here. Nope, not that one. So we can do a scatter plot, right? And so what's that showing us here? What's the scatter plot doing? Oh, I cut off the top now. Yeah. Yeah, or kind of nearness, right? So, um, so what the histogram does more is like just kind of give you almost like a bulk view of the data, it's kind of like you know a big, big gross. Um, you know, how does this kind of block compare to this other block? Whereas this is telling us kind of regional experiments, right? So like, like you can see there's a lot of clustering in here, right? Which we saw with the histogram because of the call, but at the same time, you can kind of see the variation and where the variation is. So sometimes this is just a better way to get a sense of like, you know, how outlier are the outliers, right? How, how massed together are the centers? And then we're going to do something more interesting than that, um, which is where we're going to start getting into being able to do predictions. So what we want to do is, all right, let's let's ask the, let's ask you. So how might we, if we want to make a prediction based on the parent's height of what the future child's height will be, what can we use about this data? to try to do that. Any theories? All right, well, so what we can do is we have past data, which is what this is. What we wanna do is predict future, right? So what we can do is we can look at when we have a parent average height of 68 inches, what do the children look like, okay? 
And then we can kind of take something in the center there and make a pretty good guess that if you take another kid who comes along with parent, uh, with parents who are average out to 68 inches, then they're gonna be, I don't know, maybe looking at that 66, maybe, maybe a little taller, hard to tell. Um, so, but to do that, we can actually grid out kind of the, the various parts we care about by adding in lines surrounding our checked area, okay? And so the theory here is that if we go one inch around the thing we care about, that that'll be a kind of a good bucket to make a height prediction. Does that make sense? So we have, you know, 67 and a half, but then 67 and a half, my, my right row. Yeah, so, um, and then to 68 and a half, and basically, so basically we're looking at this inch around this. Um, right, um, yeah, okay. And so we put those uh, ugly red lines there. Um, and, you know, we can, going back to somebody asked me, you know, it's like, we really want to get annoying about it. Um, we can make them really big and thick uh, in case they're not visible. So, let me check my cheat sheet. Um, So then what we can do is, and it was funny because uh, whenever a couple weeks ago I said, you know, I hardly ever see the word mean anymore. It's almost always the word average. Um, uh, but here we're actually going to use a tool that actually, or a, like a function to actually get the mean so that we can look at what's in the middle in that data. Okay, so we're going to say, all right, we're going to pull out the mid-parent height that are all the mid-parent heights, sorry, that are between 67 and a half inches and 68 and a half inches. Um, and then we're gonna take that, pull out the child height and get the average, okay? So basically we wanna make a spot in between those two lines, which tells us what the child height should be. Um, and so basically if you have parents that come along and they're somewhere in that spectrum of 67 and a half, 68 and a half, their kid should be 66 inches-ish. Um, speaking as somebody who has kids, right, um, the predictions they give you now for like your, your kid's height is like ridiculously close, uh, at least with my oldest kid. My other two I haven't gotten to their full height yet. Um, it's really quite interesting, like quite surprising. Um, all right, so now we want to like put that on a graph so we can see it, okay? And so what we do here is we're going to take our scatter plot and then we're going to put our line in the middle or, uh, or, or not in the middle but on the you know on either side and then we're going to drop in a dot for uh where that mean is all right and here we'll make this oops to make sure you can see it so i mean eyeballing it right that's about where we put it but this kind of tells us exactly where it is um, and then we can actually get the numeric value too, uh, you know, if we want to use that for further calculations, which surprisingly, um, I like to uh, set myself up. Uh, we're going to do by trying to write a function to predict the height. Okay. So I'll start it with predict, and we're going to call it brilliantly height as the input. All right, does anybody have, uh, let's take a minute and uh, see if you can work out what that function should look like. Typing, typing. And I'll put the, I'll put on the screen a hint.
Anybody got it? So obviously when you get it, right, if you feed it, um, you know, like whatever, it should be like 67 and a half or 68, um, you should get back something like 66. So you can cross check it. Anybody got it? All right, so I will start. So let's ask a, a piece of the question, okay? So what's the first thing we need to find in order to accomplish this prediction? And we're making the assumption that we wanna be an inch around um, the question, right? So if somebody puts in 68, we want 67 and a half and 68 and a half as our bounding region. So what's the first thing we need to do? And we're putting in the parent's height and we want the child's height. Any theories? And don't forget, you know, you can be totally wrong. It's fine. Oh, go ahead. Right. So, so we're going to want something like R between um, H minus, uh, I'm going to do it your way instead of the way that uh, is in my cheat sheet because one slash two looks, bothers me. Um, and then what's on the other side? Right. Okay, so we know what the R between is, but we want that off of what? We need to pull out a part of the table, right? So how would we get that part of the table? Uh, again, a little louder, sorry. Yep. Then, then the first parameter is mid parent height. Get my casing right. All right. Now, so here's one of the things that we keep recommending you do. Um, so I'm going to do it right here so we can kind of do this in pieces. Um, so So let's say H equals 68. I'm missing a paren. Um, and then, right, so now we should have just the mid-parent heights that are uh, 67 and a half up to 68 and a half looks-ish, right? Um, you know, we can further check it if we want to, um, but let's just say for the sake of argument that it's correct. All right, so we know that piece. Okay, but we probably need to do something with that, right? So we're gonna to wanna to stick that in a variable. All right, and then what do we do next? So now we wanna spit out. So we could, that would give the whole block back, but we want a single answer. So how would we get just, so now what we want to return, right, is this child height. But what do we want to do to it first? Right, we want to take the average. So how would we do that? Well, we know it's off of nearby, if I can spell. So how do we get the average out or the mean? Right. 
exactly. So we take a column called child height. Um, and we, how do we get the average off of it or the mean off of it? And that's all I said, right? So it did parse, sorry. I couldn't tell if it had actually executed. And I'll screw that up again. Come here. All right, so now I can just feed it a value and I should get the answer back. And so that, what we want to do here, right, is we cross check this number with when we were kind of doing it manually up here and make sure it's the same. That means we have a pretty good guess that the predict algorithm is right. Um, it's not actually like completely conclusive. What we would, should do, right, is try something like off the end of the table, you know, something else arbitrary and then do another one manually or whatever. But I'm pretty confident it's correct. So now we have this prediction. Um, and so now we can try maybe some other predictions um, and see where they fall. Good, seems to be working correctly. Um, and so now, just trying to, yeah, okay. So now, in, what I want to do is add to the table, okay? I want to add all the predicted heights for all the children. Okay. So, how would I do that? We just talked about this last class. Do we really, anyone remember the function we used last class that was specifically around creating a new column with a function? Not really a new column, but close. Apply, Apply right. So how do we use apply for this? So, so we'll give it a name, right? So we're gonna say predicted heights. And then we're gonna use apply. All right, so remember how we pass parameters to this? Yeah. Did somebody raise their hand? Oh, sorry. All right. So, how do we? What do we pass in to apply to make it work? Exactly. Predict and then mid parent height. And if I spell heights correctly, all the rest of the code will work better. And if I spell parent correctly as well. All right, and then let's just print out the results. And so, do you remember what this is gonna give us back before it comes up? Oh, there it is. So it's an array now of all the predictive heights in the order that they were in the table okay so as i've said in the past right this is a little bit cheating relying on the order in the table uh, to continue to remain the same so keep in mind that because they didn't sort it or anything like that it can be a little dangerous but you know for the sake of the exercise we're gonna we're gonna pretend it always works all right so there's a whole mess of numbers right um and does anybody notice here See all these repeats? Why do you think those repeats are there? Twins. Twins is a good argument. Um, uh, there's another. There's another one that's simpler than that, though. Let's uh, give you a little bit of backstory for it. How many parents are in the typical family uh, when we have a man and a woman, or whatever? Um, or let's say blood parents. How many, there's usually two, right? Then how many kids? Let's say somewhere between zero and 27, right? Um, however, how many average parent heights are there? Right, there's only one. So irrelevant of the number of kids, they're always gonna have the same mid-parent, or they're always gonna have the same height prediction. Does that make sense? So 
now let's attach that to our table. I think it's the next step we want to do. Yeah. So now we can just do. Oh, I already have it here. So now our table has the predicted heights. Um, and as I was kind of pointing out, right, this is always 70. Doesn't matter what the kid's actual height was, doesn't matter their gender, doesn't matter their order of uh, birth. Um, they only have two parents in this scenario that could be inputting into the average, right? <clears throat> All right, so, oops. Just kind of remember what's there. Um, all right, so does anybody remember how, let's say what we're going to do now is compare uh, the child height, okay, to the predicted height in a scatter plot. All right, so anybody remember how you might go about that? So remember, we have all these columns, right? But do we need all of them? So how do we how do we just pull out a few columns? So I remember the function. Right on. All right. So I remember I was actually modifying Dalton itself, um, and so I'm just going to drop these in here. So mid parent height. Actually, I'm going to copy and paste it, so I'm most likely to make typos. All right, and then now I have just those columns. So what can I do now? If I want to make a scatter plot. We just call the scatter. Um, and then because what we want to do is we want to see the mid parent heights kind of across the bottom. And then we want the child heights and the predicted heights like up in the content. Um, we're going to just pass the single field of mid parent height. So now, and you know, if you can't see this well, um, this the yellow is actually a set of dots. It's not a line. Um, so just that you know, obviously they fall a bunch, and so they look like a line. Um, but so now we're seeing that we have you know their real heights kind of around it. But the yellow line, you know, yellow dots, right, do kind of look like they are going through kind of the middle, right, or the the most uh, populous area. So so that tells us we're you know we're getting in the right ballpark. Um, and in a second we're gonna talk about prediction accuracy. But before we do that, let's just look at the slides. So one of the things that I ran into, oh, actually, let's skip this and come back to it so I have an example. Um, all right, so we are gonna jump into prediction accuracy. All right, so I made a prediction that seems like a terrible idea without also having a sense of how accurate it is, right? Because I could just, you know, off the cuff say, you will be, you know, 12 feet tall, you will be three feet tall. So what we want to be able to do is say, what's the accuracy of our prediction? Okay. So in order to do that, we can kind of continue on our merry way. Does anybody have a theory? Okay. So anybody have a guess as to how we would figure out what the accuracy is? of the actual child height versus the predicted height. And what I'm looking for is like a mathematical way of saying whether it's it's accurate or not. So what would I what would I do to figure out the accuracy? So it could be, except it doesn't have to be that complex in this scenario because we know we have a single point, which is the child height, and we have another single point that is the predicted height. So there's no there's no need for a deviation process. We could do something very simple to say, you know, 
we have, I don't want to say the word because it gives it away, but we have a predicted height and we have the actual two height. So what could we do between the two to find out the error? Subtract and find the difference, right? Um, obviously with subtraction, we have to be a little bit careful about negative numbers, right? So, you know, you want to be careful about absolute value and that kind of stuff. But um, other than that, because we don't, we don't actually care. Well, we do care. We're going to show it with the negative and positive. But in a sense, you know, uh, uh, an inaccuracy of two and an inaccuracy of negative two in a lot of ways are the same thing, right? They're just the direction of the inaccuracy, but they're still both wrong the same amount. Does that make sense? So a lot of the time, if I was doing something like this, I would actually look for the absolute version of the inaccuracy because usually that's what I care about because I want to know I want to know how far away I am kind of in general. I don't really care what direction, I'm, how far away I am. But in this case, we're going to do the simple version. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we are going to write a function to figure out the error. And I'm not going to ask you to write that one because that one's pretty easy. Um, so how do I get to, okay, so now I have this, you know, basically a different calculator. Um, how could I create an array of the error? Very, very similar to creating an array of the predictions. I think somebody over there said it before. What function would I use on the on the columns to be able to apply this? Oh, and I just said, it. so you can use the apply function, right? To apply this uh, function on the table um, because we can do, I think it's already written here. Yeah, because what we can do is we can give it two inputs and I don't know if you remember from last time, but it's, it's kind of very simplistic, right? So you tell it the function you want to apply, then you tell it the first parameter to give it and you tell it the second parameter to get it. If there's 27, right, you do 27 of them. Um, but it's very, uh, you know, kind of very straightforward. And it's going to take, so for each row, it's going to take the value in this column and subtract uh, the value in that column. And it's going to give us an array, and we're going to call that prediction errors or pred errors. Um, oh, just by way of context and stuff, uh, ERR is a very common shorthand for error as well. Uh, so if you see that around Python uses it a lot actually. Um, and so that's why that's pluralized there and that's why it's short for it. Um, but as you can see, I have a whole bunch of prediction errors. Some of them are negative, some of them are positive, right? Because they could be kind of either way on the spectrum. Um, we do know, right, that they're always up and down though, right? They're always on the y-axis because you can only be taller or shorter than the predicted height. That makes sense. The predicted height can't, doesn't change. It's always your height or the child's height that is taller or shorter than the predicted height. Sometimes errors are a lot more complex. That is a lot of numbers. Um, all right, so now, look at my cheat sheet again. Um, so now what we wanna do is we wanna attach that to the table again. And so now we have, the child's height, right? The predicted height and its error. Um, so that we can get, start to get a sense of what, how bad the error is on our predictions. Um, so what might we do to look at uh, basically the error and, and get a sense of the strength of the error? Any ideas? We need more like quizzes or something. I don't know. Um, all right. So what can we do to, to see the strength of the error uh, on this? Yeah. A histogram. Yeah. So we can take a histogram of just the errors. And now we can conveniently see what is, you know, kind of what our, what our error range is, um, where most of the errors are. But if you look at this, right, our predictions are actually pretty good, right? Because they're, you know, the bulk of it is kind of close to zero. 
right? Because zero is, a, is an accurate prediction. Um, and then, you know, obviously we go either direction, but our prediction is actually fairly accurate. Um, then, let's see. Okay, yeah, and we'll talk about that in a second. All right, so then, just trying to look for the, all right, so then we were talking about this a little bit before, um, but can anybody think of, okay, so we're doing this friction thing. Um, why do we have this, you know, these errors? What, you know, uh, Let's actually, I'm not going to talk about it that way. It's too complicated. So let, let's look at where we do know where there is a very likely set of error, okay? Which is if we think about gender. And if you notice, what gender has more error here? Y'all think yeah so that's the way i always look at it too but it's actually not because it's actually closer in is the male and the female is more skewed out so kind of kind of neither in both um so it's the height is the amount of error but it's if the height is really high on zero, that means there's no error, right? So it's the fact that there's more height and more kind of breadth further away from zero that means that the females are more wrong or more in error. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and I think we're going to talk about that more in a minute. Yeah. So here's kind of like the Kind of more social question why do you think that might be why do you think that the predicted error is worse for uh females than it is for males yeah So yes and no. Again, um, like let's just pretend for the sake of argument that um, all the heights are taken, all the child heights are taken when they have reached adult height. So that's not going to be a problem in this particular case. Um, so again, same same environmental problem we, we were talking about before. Um, so you know the parents will be a male and a female, right? And if you have an average of their heights, is it going to skew? tall or short compared to the children right it's going to probably skew tall so in other words like you have a couple of different problems going in there using the average of the parents height right the males will be it'll be too short for the males right and it'll be too tall for the women right so and like my guess is the reason we're kind of seeing this layout right is that the that problem is worse with women um, and slightly better with men. So, and in, in a minute, I think, let me just look at my slides where we're at here. Um, yeah, so one thing I wanted to point out, um, and we'll talk about the slide real quick, is you see this line here, okay? I'm pretty confident none of you have seen it before, but if, you see this error, right? So this is actually not an error. It's actually what we call a warning. Um, and the reason you can tell it's a warning is because it says warning somewhere in it versus saying error somewhere in it. Um, does anybody have a theory what the difference is between a warning and an error? Like, why do we care it's a warning versus an error? Just go by the words. Right, so the, the warning um, is a warning, right? You probably shouldn't do this, 
An error is, no, no, you can't do this, okay? And specifically in this case, what this is talking about is, anybody know the word deprecation? This is one of those ones where I'm not sure if it's English or, or tech. Um, so deprecation is when something is being phased out, okay? So what this is saying is, hey, this thing that you're using is going away soon, okay? Hasn't gone away yet, that's why it's not an error, but it's gonna go away soon. So you better fix your code if you're seeing this, okay? So the reason I pointed out is if you are running into it, um, obviously, you know, ask on Piazza or whatever, uh, if you throw that line into the salt block, it'll get rid of it if you want it to display nicely. Um, and, you know, it's pretty straightforward. But the reason I really wanted to point it out is because, as we were kind of talking about last time, all this stuff is available to you to go check out anytime you want. So when I ran into that and I was like, this thing is annoying, I want it to go away. I basically did a Google search for the error message with data science and tables in the Google search. And I came back with, here is this issue, right? Um, and basically it's saying, hey, we need to do this. And then somebody here said, oh, it'd be nice if we created a minimal example uh, to be able to test with, basically. And so I saw that and I was like, well, I'm having this problem. I'll write them a minimal example. Um, and so I kind of added to the error. And then the other thing that I noticed is that this is a cross reference to another error. And this has a lot more movement on it. Um, so it looks like there's a, a bunch of instances of this particular warning. Uh, and, but what I really like about open source, right, is that I can just go find this, right? I can just go find out the issue. I can tell how long it's been open. So it's only was open like a week or two ago, right? Um, so it's probably gonna get fixed sometime soon. Um, you know, a lot of people are running into it, so it's probably important. So I don't need to worry about it too much. Um, but then in this case, I can also try to help out by saying, hey, um, if you're running into this, you can actually use this as a workaround. Um, and I can kind of give back to the community to say, hey, you know, this might help you in the near term while, while these folks figure it out or fix it or whatever. Um, if I was really feeling ambitious, I would go and look at the code and try to fix it, uh, but I'm not. So I did it all for a workaround so that people could get, you know, get on with their day until somebody gets a chance to use it. Uh, does anybody know what uh, YMMV means? It's one of those ones where um, I use this all the time. Uh, maybe people use it texting, I don't know. Um, so it means your mileage may vary. So uh, workarounds are dangerous, right? Because anytime you're suppressing a warning or an error, um, it means you're not seeing it. So you may be getting unintended side effects. So that's why I said, hey, you can do this, but your mileage may vary. So take it with a caveat. All right, so I just wanted to show, uh, or show how, you know, when you run into something like that, how you can kind of go and address it. And literally all I did was take this, um, this error right here, like this, just this part, not the whole thing, and then scope it down with, this is the module I care about, and then this is the uh, particular object I care about by using data science and tables, and I kind of read around a little bit. Um, but I actually think that first one I showed you was actually my first result on Google. All right, so, yeah, okay. So continuing on with predictions, uh, let me find my cheat sheet. All right, so we talked about gender, excuse me, being a problem. Um, and let me see, yeah, okay. Um, so does anybody have any theories about how, like how could we solve for this problem? Like how could we make our predictions more accurate? And I'm just looking for like an English answer, not like code. Yeah, exactly. So write another function 
um, that is, as it's, it's smartly labeled here, predict smarter, right? Um, and so we're, we're running a little low on time. So I was gonna ask you all to do this, but um, so the first thing we do is we start with our nearby that we talked about before, right? So we grab, um, you know, a half inch on either side of whatever you're looking for. Um, but then we can start to think about, hey, what if we, um, you know, basically scoped to the gender, right? Um, and then basically where, so what we do is we kind of just say, okay, now we have this nearby, which is the whole set. And then we can say, okay, let's just grab, you know, essentially the girls out of here. And then if, then we can return the result based on the gender. Does that make sense? So very simply, we can pull out the average based on the gender. Um, oh, sorry, I was misreading this. This is a variable. So this is the gender getting passed in. So G is, G is short for gender here, not girl, which is what I was misreading it as. Um, so it's gonna pull out whatever label you put in here. So as you can see, here's an example. So if you pass in female, um, it's, uh, it's gonna give you just the females um, and if you pass in male, it's gonna give you just the males. Uh, this is why you write out your variable names instead of just using like a single character. So you remember what you did later. All right, so now we should get two different predictions for the females and males. Um, and if you notice, right, like neither one of these is the prediction you were getting before, which is like 62.4 maybe, something like that. Um, so that's a much, it's probably a much better prediction uh, based on the gender. Um, so then, so what do we do next? If we wanna go, if we wanna get our whole table with better predictions for heights. Right, so we just apply that one onto the same data set. And so we get our big nasty array. So we ran everything and it doesn't fail. Um, and then we just kind of doing the same thing. We just attach it. Oh, it's not printing it, sorry. Um, we just attach it back onto our table, right? Um, and one thing I want to point out a little bit uh, is that this is definitely the kind of thing that you want to do as a separate named thing. Because as you saw, right, how long it took to run it. So it's much better to do that once and then start using that name from there on instead of like, put, because you could obviously just put this content right here, right? Um, and you don't have to make it a named result, but if you if you're doing something that that's what we refer to usually as expensive, it's better to name the results. You don't have to do it again. All right, and so now we have our old predicted height, and then we have the smarter predicted height, which is accounting for gender, um, and we just kind of keep attaching it to the table because we're kind of making an ugly result. Um, and then we find out the next question, which is, will this work, right? Um, do we think that the error will be better? How do we check for our um, error ratio now? We can just do the same thing we were doing before, which is pull out um, the predicted errors from like our smarter predicted errors from the actual child height, we get to dump that into an array, 
then we can attach that to uh, our table again. And so we'll now just have another column of the actual error results. Uh, it shouldn't take that long. Um, and then we can actually look at the overlap. And as you can see, that clearly made a big difference, right? So it's much, much better. Um, so yeah, so, you know, partially we're showing you here is like, you know, how to do some errors and how to get the differences and then look at the results and stuff. But to, you know, part of what your job is, right, is to try to think about the ways that the thing you're trying to accomplish when you're doing predictions are wrong, right? So, um, so you want to always try to look at the accuracy of something that's a prediction. And then you need to like noodle through kind of the how, how do you reduce that error? Um, and sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll go through that whole process and you'll be like, Nope, no change. Um, so, you know, you kind of have to just play with it a bit based on kind of your own knowledge. And this also is where that vertical information helps. The more knowledge you have about the subject area, the more likely you are to be able to do a good guess on that uh, thing. Um, the other thing that uh, we often have when we're kind of working in, you know, when we're in a horizontal is that in the vertical, we'll have what's often referred to as an SME. Does anyone know what that acronym means? SME. I'd be surprised, but you never know. All right, so that's a subject matter expert. All right, and the reason I mentioned the acronym is because nine times out of 10, people just write the acronym because it's short. Um, so if you see SME or someone says SME or SME, uh, they mean a subject matter expert. So what you would do with that, right, is you know if you knew nothing about gender uh, and gender height variations or whatever, you would you know have a person who knows this stuff that you can kind of say okay hey here's my errors and you can kind of show them the errors here's my predictions here's how i'm calculating it what what could be wrong with this um and uh you know they, they often will have ideas even if you can't figure it out so that's often useful um so i think this is another worthless slide yes uh so we're going to talk quickly about grouping because i think we can do the first step of it in the time we have less, maybe we'll get further. Um, so moving away from predictions on uh, we call it? predictions on height, um, we're now going to talk about ice cream cones um, or cones of something. I'm going to go with ice cream because I've never seen anything else in a cone. Um, so we have this little table of flavors. Um, and then colors for the color of the ice cream, and then the price if you wanted to buy it. Um, and uh, I think I think those pricing is all in euros. Let's say for the sake of entertainment. Um, all right. So wow. Um, so the first thing we want to do is. Do you all remember the group command? So we can group by a column. And we talked about this a little bit already. So what this tells us is um, we can group by flavor. If you notice the flavor is repeated up there, so we can actually group them. And we have three different styles, let's say, of chocolate, um, and two of strawberry, and only one of bubblegum. Um, so that gives us a nice little count back. Um, but then we can start to do more interesting things by actually like this is kind of like the apply function except it's more built into the group we can actually get other kinds of data by looking at things like the average and in this case the average we're looking at is price average this is the kind of code i don't really like to see because it's not very clear what it's trying to accomplish but it's just dropping the color column so that it doesn't interfere essentially and then you're going to group by flavor and then you're going to average whatever the other field is which is what I don't like about it very much. Um, so, but we get, you know, we have these different flavors um, and the price average based on uh, the different types. Um, so clearly what you want to be selling the most of is chocolate flavored ice cream or chocolate flavored cones or something. Um, all right, does anybody, let's see. Oh, actually let's say, and then 
that kind of second parameter is pretty arbitrary, right? So we can also do something like what's the cheapest by doing min, okay? Um, and as you can see, what we want to sell the least of is the strawberry because that's the minimum price. Obviously, higher prices are better for our business. Um, so what we can do then, so does that make sense? So you've got this group function uh, by default, it just kind of counts stuff up for you. Um, and then let me just look at what my slide says. Yeah, so it kind of groups stuff up for you, um, but then you can kind of apply things if you don't want just to count, you want some other piece of data, like an average or like a minimum or a maximum or whatever. Um, so then we can kind of do something similar with our survey data. And we can really do some arbitrary things here, but I want to show a couple things. So remember categorical data, right? So here we're grouping by Python skill, okay? But this is essentially an NA, right? Like there's no way to average or count or whatever these things. Uh, I'm sorry, there's no way to average them, which is what I asked it to do. So it's just blank, okay? Um, and then I can find out that if you have, um, you know, fairly high Python skill, uh, you tend to check a lot of people, except here. So, like, these are, you know, these are not really correlations, right? But they're entertaining anyway. Um, sleep hours, you know, of course, you have very low Python skill or very high, you sleep the most. So, one of the two is the right answer. Um, I thought these results were amusing. So, then we can. But then we can do something, we can do stuff that's more interesting by getting rid of those columns that don't, that are not numerical, um, so that we can do more interesting groupings and we can actually look at the averages. Um, and we should get the same results, um, but obviously then we just have that data. And then if we have that data, we can feed it to other things more simply than having to drop those columns all the time. Like if we want to do, you know, a graph or whatever, which conveniently enough, um, oh, I had another example of ludicrousness. Um, wait, is that the same? Oh no, so, oh, sorry. I thought I thought I was doing the other one first. Um, so yeah, so in this case, right? Um, oh no, it is the, yeah, no, I'm doing the same. Yeah, I'm doing the same thing again. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, this, you know, I just gave it a name. So, but now I can do things like graph it. But what I wanted to show you was um, we don't have to do it that way, right? We can actually declare which parts, right, using the select. And if we just use the numbers, it's a little easier, a little easier to read, arguable. Um, and then we can kind of plot it out and we can get rid of the categorical columns this way. I would probably, for the most part, uh, tend towards pulling it out like up here um, because I think it's cleaner. But you know, this is also very doable, especially if you have like seventy-five columns, right? Um, you know, you just want to you're like experimenting, looking for something. This can be a lot easier to work with. Um, as you can see, this data is not terribly correlating, but I think it's fun. um yeah and then i just i had another example of the same thing so we won't do that but we will talk about this real quick so this is kind of the you know the like takeaway right is that you know when you're grouping by one column it aggregates all the roles the rows Does everybody know what the word aggregate means i use it all the time but can we define aggregate Yeah, it means like crush up, right? Um, or, you know, the simpler word is group, right? Um, I don't know why people tend to use the word aggregate instead of group, but that's all it means. So it aggregates all the rows. Oh, usually aggregate means uh, when you have multiple things um, versus grouping. Um, the value for a single column is the resulting table. Uh, so this is the easy part, right? What is it you want to group on? But then this is where it gets a lot cooler. Right, is that you can do a lot of things to that data, um, you know, per row or per group, rather. 
Um, and so there's a couple of ideas, right? But then, you know, we showed like min and average as well. Um, let's see if we can talk about lists quickly. So anybody have any questions? You've already seen a bunch of this. Um, so hopefully it's just a refresher. So let's talk about lists. All right. What was uh, one of the defining characteristics of MakeArray? When you do use MakeArray, what are you supposed to put in it? It's supposed to be all the same type of thing, right? Um, so you shouldn't mix your types. Um, with lists, which for a lot of like kind of all intents and purposes in a sense are very, very similar to arrays. Um, you mix the types or can mix the types. You don't have to, obviously, but it will retain them. Okay. So now we have a list of things. But the thing to remember, right, is now I can't apply like sum on that, right? It's going to peak, right? It's going to grow. Uh, so, but I, you know, but there might be other things I can do. Print, for example, right? I can print all of those. So, you have to kind of think about what's in the box, right? And uh, I know I was type talking about typing. You know, some languages do typing and some don't. Um, so in Python, you have to think about typing when before you pass it to something because the type may not map, right? So if you're using a list, for example, you need to be sure that the list, uh, you know, is is of the right type for the thing you want to pass it to. A list, um, I don't know if you if you can tell, right, but is characterized by brackets, okay? So it's also conveniently enough, the same characters you use in math uh, to indicate like a set or a list. Uh, I don't know if you use the word list in math. Uh, you definitely use the word set. But if you think of a math set, a list is the same, okay? No guarantee about the order, no guarantee about the type, just that there's some things in the brackets, right? Uh, and then they're separated by comments. And so we, so that thing, right? We have made a list. We made an object, right? The thing is, I didn't apply it to anything. There's no name on it or whatever, so it's just getting thrown away. But that's that's all the syntax is for making a list. Um, but we can also do more sophisticated things. Not there. Wrong window. Like this, where we actually have an array inside a list. Okay, and so. You notice, right? It has this, you know, numeric, the one, the five, and then a hello, and then a five dot zero. So that's a float. Um, but then there's actually an array directly embedded. You can also embed another list. You can embed, embed whatever you want. That's kind of the point. Um, so, but you know, obviously, most of the time, I want to give it a, a name, right? Uh, so that I can use it later or whatever. Or like, why am I doing it if I'm not like putting it in a name in a sense? Um, so that's how you make a list. Um, and just to go quickly over the rules for lists, um, a sequence of values, um, just like an array. And as I showed before, characterized by, these are, by the way, uh, this is one of the things you learn in programming and I think you don't learn anywhere else. Uh, square bracket, parentheses, and then you also have uh, the greater than the less than signs or angle brackets, okay? And then the thing that looks like a squiggly is referred to as a squiggly, left squiggly and right squiggly. Um, so if I use those terms, that's what I mean. So characterized by square brackets, arrays are characterized by parents. Um, and because I'm super into build size lately, uh, right? Position zero, just like arrays, one, two. Um, and yeah, you can use it to create table rows. Um, if you create a table, um, it's going to convert it on the fly, um, but may go poorly if it's not full of the things that you expect it to be full of. Uh, so just be careful of that. Um, let's see what my next slide is. Yeah. All right, let's stop there for today. Um, and we can talk about multi-column grouping next time, um, and pivots and joins. Um, any questions? 
little bit whirlwind today. 